What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is Nick, I promise, and this is Big Dogs Got E Fantasy Football. BDGE, BDGE, MonkeyKnifeFight.com, promo code BGE. We are diving into player props, as always, every Saturday morning. Uh, there's been a couple of weeks in a row where we haven't really hit it because of uh, holidays, and me and Joe were both traveling and etc etc a bunch of excuses that i shouldn't be making it's monkeyknifefight.com the best place to fun games about player props now if you're new to monkeyknifefight.com basically they're centered around fantasy points fantasy uh, scoring reception collection touchdown dance things like that they have all of the different sports on here so if you're into nba whatever you have stuff to do in the off season unlike myself so you know you pick a game or you can pick like the early games collectively or the late games collectively and what you do is there are a bunch of different game types that you could play to try to win money obviously we're here to win money we're here to pay the mortgage monkeyknifefight.com if you use the promo code bdge you deposit 5, 10, 15, 82, 36 bucks. You will get a 100% deposit match. If you use the link down below, y'all are also going to get a free $5. Dollar, 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 dollar bills, y'all, when you sign up at monkeyknifefight.com. Now, this is an odd uh, this is an odd setup this week because a lot of the games that I would typically smash, right? Normally, when you play these games, you pick like two or three players and you base it around either receptions or touchdowns or something this is tough because i like green bay versus washington but i'm pretty sure in lambo it's going to be rainy and snowy and very cold Actually, they're pretty used to doing it aaron Rodgers is but i would still rather shy away from a game than you know go head to head with that game now i'm gonna pull up yahoo does a good job of keeping up with the weather reports and stuff for the games like as you can see next to the players here they give you like a forecast weather wise if there's anything that should be of note so in jacksonville for this game there's going to be a 45 percent chance of precipitation all right so the weather view for the green bay game there was supposed to be snow and rain but that went away so it's mostly cloudy with a high of 39 low of 33 that's good news for the packers and Devontae adams and Aaron Jones. So we can hammer that game, but I like to collectively do the star shootouts. So that takes all of the early games and then you can mess around with any of these game types. So y'all can go win money on your own. You could fade me and probably win money at this point. But one of the funner things to do are the over under challenges. So they line you up and depending on whatever the number is up here, three out of four, two out of two, you have to hit three out of four correct on the over under four fantasy points or whatever statistic that they give you here now these are full ppr scoring settings so we hit c mac on the over lamar jackson i would actually go under he was talking about how the weather kind of affected him last week and i think it's gonna be a very tough matchup for him in buffalo and i don't think he's gonna put up a dud game by any by any means but i, I would imagine him more in the 21 to 24 range than the 25 to like 28 range so i'd go under here iron rogers over dalvin cook's banged up yeah so it's like a lot of a lot of iffy factors here i think with a lot of games because dalvin cook's banged up so he'd be one of the big contributors uh, we all can mess around with the game types and whatnot a monkey knife fight we're gonna go back to the touchdown dance as we typically do what you have to do is pick three players the goal is to hit two and a half touchdowns and you get 2x the money that you bet down so if you head over to monkeyknifefight.com they're gonna give you five bucks if you use the link down below sign up with promo code bdge 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 you're gonna get 100 percent deposit match bonus with whatever you throw in you're gonna head over to the touchdown dance what i like to do this is exactly what i did last week i went c-mac i went aaron jones and i went Devontae adams because these two Green Bay players are very funneled in their offense in terms of where the touchdowns go. They almost all exclusively go to Devontae Adams and Aaron Jones. Last week, I know we missed. We had two touchdowns, but Aaron Jones got stuffed on the one-yard line like three times, which very, very rarely ever happens to him. He always converts his touchdowns. He's been like the highest in terms of converting his carries within the 10-yard line for touchdowns over the last two years. Highest percentage of any running back in the NFL. Devontae Adams is always a good bet to score a touchdown with Aaron Rodgers. So I love these. If you want to pivot away from Adams and go with three workhorse running backs, we have Nick Chubb against uh, Cincinnati, which is a fantastic matchup. I will say, though, I tweeted this out yesterday. If y'all are not following me on Twitter, I suggest you do so. It's at Nick underscore BDGE. Put out a vlog yesterday. What else? Have we NFL leaders and goal line carries inside the five. So you have C-Mac leading, Dalvin Cook with 14. Chubb's down here at five. So he's top five. All right, y'all, we're going to pivot to the DFS portion of today's video. As always, my man, Joe Holka, uh, make sure you're following him on Twitter and all of his other socials, which will be linked in the description. We've missed the last couple of weeks due to travel and holidays and those other things, but we are coming back. We're coming back stronger than ever. And uh, hopefully we will help y'all pay the mortgage this week with our DFS picks. Now, I got some money left in my account. I didn't realize I did. So I'm going to go ahead and play. I might actually just make you send me a lineup 
in the in my DMs. I'm just gonna roll with that one. Um, so we gotta we gotta bring together our best stuff this week because we're putting real money on the line, people. Um, and Joe is always. Uh, very transparent with his stuff as we were just talking about behind the scenes uh, anytime he plays his lineups or he makes picks for other people or whatnot he's always posting it out there into the world so uh, you're not going to find a more transparent dude when it comes to dfs then joe what's going on i hope you're well rested ready to roll and uh and we're gonna make some good picks today feels good feels good to be back at it after the holidays uh, we were just talking about uh just yeah showing results i'm not a big uh, screenshot person um but in terms of like going through my process, going through what I did, the tournaments that I play, like that review that I do every week has been really popular. Um, even though there's, there's always going to be trolls in the comments, especially on YouTube, they are definitely uh, willing to tell me I suck on weeks that I don't win. Uh, the <laughs> trolls were uh, pretty quiet the last, uh, last two weeks. So I think uh, those people might be gone at least for, at least until this week. So I guess if, uh, if you wanted um, some advice, uh, the advice was probably the last two weeks this week, I'm probably ready to, punt off some winnings again so hopefully not all right no let's keep that hot streak going let's keep it going and we'll roll right into the quarterbacks we'll tell them what to do at the helm of your lineups now we're looking at the top guys and it's a it's a tough week to pay up for quarterback I don't I don't imagine that's going to be advice that you're going to give because we have Lamar Jackson Pat Mahomes both guys who obviously can get it done through the air can get it done through their leg uh, with their legs and have um, you know numerous fantasy absolute firsts in uh in their season output thus far we have l jacks at buffalo uh he came out after last game was talking about how the weather kind of affected his play a little bit obviously he's still putting up fantasy points and now he's traveling to buffalo which is a very tough environment to play in not to even mention that they obviously have a very tough pass defense altogether we got pat mahomes heading to foxborough and they've allowed the single fewest fantasy points to opposing quarterbacks so that over under was pretty high I believe it was set at like 49 and I feel like that's an easy smash on the under there because people just get excited about the matchups and they don't really think a lot of things through when it comes to that so if we're pivoting away from the top dogs Lamar Jackson Pat Mahomes how do you see the rest of the quarterback uh, position kind of playing out I'm assuming you're looking in the lower range it's a tough week at quarterback man I, I normally like right away see a few guys that look super underpriced that I'm really interested in I think the one guy that's a little bit cheaper that's going to draw some ownership is Ryan Tannehill. He's 5,800. I have some concerns with Ryan Tannehill, and I, I know that we uh, typically at quarterback, we always want to kind of skew towards efficiency. He is someone that I, I think has been undervalued this year in terms of how well he's been playing. Um, I mean, just keep it in as simple as yards per attempt. Like, that's the thing that I definitely put a lot of emphasis in. He's leading the entire slate. I believe he's leading the league in that category right now. So I, I like Tannehill. My concern is, like, if there comes a point where volume does matter a little bit. Like, he his pass attempts over the last few weeks have been uh, extremely low in comparison to some of these other guys that we're going to be considering. And he does run a decent amount, but like, I don't know, I, I'm going to kick this one back to you. How do you justify like playing a quarterback who gets through 22 passes, 18 passes, 19 passes in the last three weeks? It's really hard. He's popping as a value in, in basically anything you would look at and he does run a little bit. I don't love the weapons either. So like, I don't, I, I think I probably am going to end up fading this situation, but he's looking like he's going to be pretty popular. Yeah. I mean, Last week against Indy, he threw 22 pass attempts, and that was a high over the last three weeks. It was 22 pass attempts, 18. I mean, it's so odd because he's been so good at producing fantasy-wise, but you have zero confidence starting any of his weapons. Like A.J. Brown, Corey Davis is banged up. Uh, Delaney Walker is obviously out for the year, and Jonah Smith will fill in, but he hasn't been good. It's, it's what you said with the legs, man, because prior to last week when we only had five yards on the ground, it was 40 yards on the ground, 37 yards on the ground, 38 yards on the ground, and in those previous three weeks, he had scored three times. So – you are, you know, banking on things that probably are not predictive statistics. Like you don't want to have to, to bank on a rushing uh, touchdown from a quarterback. You don't want to have to bank on him being ridiculously efficient in the red zone and scoring touchdowns when he's only attempting 18 pass attempts. So it makes sense. I think uh, Tannehill kind of seems much more like a floor play. People will get excited because it's, you know, Tannehill and he's had a couple blow up games and he's got a great matchup against Oakland, but I'm probably on board with you. Um, when it comes to maybe pushing off of him a little bit, just because I, I'd see him more in like the 18 to 20 range, which is great for season long. And I'm, I'm a big fan of him this week as a, as a top 12 starter guy, but I'm not sure you see the upside there, especially with them just wanting to pound Derrick Henry, you know, over and over and over and over again. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably more on the, uh, you know, pessimistic side uh, of Tannehill when it comes to DFS this week. Yeah, let me run this one by you then. So for another $700 on DraftKings, like I think I'm going to try and get to Deshaun Watson this week. I haven't played. I mean, I feel like he hasn't been on the main slate in a little while, and he's been 
uh, waiting for his weapons to get healthy. We'll see what happens with Fuller and that hamstring, which is kind of scary. So, like, I guess that's the hardest part about Deshaun Watson is I can see paths for almost any of these, like, three wide receivers to have a good game. Um, I don't know. Hopkins is still pretty underpriced, but we haven't really hit, seen his ceiling recently. Like, this is a stack that I'm warming up to, but I think if I'm going to roll out Deshaun Watson, I almost would prefer it in game stack situations where I just play all the guys and just hope that I capture the big Deshaun Watson game. Um, I haven't projected for the fourth most rushing yards on the slate right now for at the quarterback position. So I like that quite a bit. The matchup against Denver, like isn't the best in the world, but they are uh, pretty decent sized home favorites with a nice team total. Um, I, a lot of things are pointing me in the direction of going to Deshaun Watson this week. Uh, 6,500. He, he seems like a, a decent price point. I, I don't love a lot of the cheaper guys this week, which is uh, unfortunate because the value is not great either. So we'll see what happens in roster construction. But what do you think about Sean Watson at the top end? I think he's as high as I'm going. Yeah, I like that call. I think a lot of people will be, will be pivoting just because he's going against Denver. Um, and they've been a, a good defense against the pass uh, for sure this year. I know Chris Harris will likely be matching up with DeAndre Hopkins uh, a lot throughout this game. But yeah, if Will Fuller can get on the field and they have those field stretching guys, I think Watson will be fine. Um, they do also get, I believe it's 10 days of rest coming off of their last game, unless I'm making that up. Um, they played New England in week third. Sounds right. Right. They played on Thursday Night Football. I think so. Yeah, I think that's why I did like because I, I mostly like 99% of my action is on the main slate anyway. So I, I don't I can't remember seeing Deshaun. Right, yeah, at least, I'm at pretty least sure weeks. it's been a while. Yeah, because I remember I started one of my matchups off really early strong with uh, the Watson Hopkins in the yep. season one league. Um, so that being said, I mean, they have 10 days of, of rest and preparing for this Denver defense. And I mean, just Denver doesn't have much on the offensive side of the ball. So it should be uh, a game in which they can kind of control the clock and they're playing much better at home. Obviously you don't want to be playing in Denver. So just the matchup is probably going to scare a lot of people up, uh, away, but at 6,500 when you have probably as much, if not more upside than the top guys in Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, who are very, very tough matchups this week. I, I like that Deshaun Watson call a lot, actually. Yeah. I think they're, they're in Houston this week, at least. So that that's nice. Um, I guess I, I, I've heard some talk about Kirk Cousins, 6,700 and, and you know me, like this isn't my, type of play so I looked into it like a little bit deeper um I like Cousins quite a bit I, I just think that it, it's really hard to get on board with a guy that doesn't run but if you're going to play larger field stuff I, I think that one thing that I think goes undervalued for Cousins is these really uh, these games where they're they're going to be controlling the ball or expected to control the play like they're they're almost two touchdown favorites in this game I think everyone just assumes that that's a game you go to the running backs but Cousins has been extremely efficient this year as well and especially if Adam Thielen doesn't play it could be a Stefan Diggs spot at like super low ownership. So I don't mind that stack in tournaments. I, I guess the game I'm kind of focused on, if I want to pay down a little bit at quarterback, I, I really like, uh, it sounds gross, but I like this Miami and New York Jets game a bit. Um, I, I like Fitzpatrick pretty much every week just because it, you know where the ball is going to go. He's willing to push the ball downfield. The game script's almost always in his favor because they're not a very good team. Um, yeah. So I, I like Miami quite a bit. I also think that like there's few – get right spots like playing against the Dolphins so I think that Darnold is interesting some of the weapons are pretty underpriced on the Jets side of the ball as well so like I I think that might be one of my favorite games from a fantasy perspective this week I'm not sure if I'll be able to pull the trigger on either of those guys on my main team at quarterback but I I, I do think that they're at least in play what do you think about that game yeah I love that call that this is a <laughs> if I had to predict one game that I knew you would be kind of going all in on that would be a little funky it would definitely be this game what a gross brand man <laughs> no man it's the, it's the great brand you fade the public and we love yeah. that I think uh I'm on board with that Fitz call I think <clears throat> not having Jamal Adams is going to severely impact his defense because he's been so good and a lot of people think of him as just like a big hitter and a guy who kind of controls the defense but he's number two in PFF's graded safeties this year he's also number five so he's top five in coverage safety as well so I think that gives us a lot of leeway when it comes to a guy like Mike Kosicki, who's had six or more targets and I think like five or six straight games with Preston That's Williams. My guy. Yeah, so this week I'm, I'm definitely back on the uh, on the bandwagon with Mike Kosicki. I think you have to be all over like Devontae Parker as well, which has been ridiculous so far. Um, so I like that Ryan Fitzpatrick call. I feel like, I don't know, like I, something about Sam Darnold like rubs me the wrong way. I don't know if Feels I Feels bad. Yeah, he might just be bad. Uh, it, it, I don't have any like logic or analytics or anything behind it. But this is just one of those games that in my stomach is like, eh, I don't know, because Miami's kind of riding hot right now. I think their defense has been a little bit better as of late. But, like, I would rather 
run it with like Fitz and, you know, stack Fitz and one of his pass catchers and Gesicki and uh, Devontae Parker, and then kind of run it back maybe with one okay. of the receivers uh, for the New York Jets. And I think most people will probably be on, you know, Robbie Anderson because he's been a little bit hot as of late, but I feel like a lot of that was kind of garbage time. And I don't know if we get garbage time for New York. I think the more safe play would probably be Jamison Crowder because he'll be one, a lot less owned if you're talking about, you know, big tournaments. Um, but as a PPR guy, I think he's someone that could probably take advantage of this matchup. Robbie Anderson's like always like the shiny toy that people just want to talk themselves into just because like, it, like mentally, that's what you think of when you think of like Robbie Anderson's like big plays, like, like you're watching the red zone, red zone channel and he just breaks off a 70 yard touchdown. Like that could easily happen, but like, let's not forget like the last times these, these two teams played Crowder is the one that just went absolutely nuclear in this spot. So um, I'm with you. I kind of like Crowder uh, with Arnold. I, I like the idea of stacking up fits and bring it back with one of these other weapons. I do think that Le'Veon Bell is in play as well, but quarterback's tough this week, man. I, I don't love any of the cheap options. If you wanted to go all the way down, maybe Gardner Minshew. We'll see. That game environment is horrendous in general. Um, so I don't know. I, I think maybe naked Minshew at 5,400 if you really got in a pinch, but I would prefer just to, to pay up a little bit more than normal this week. So hopefully we can find some value. Yeah, I think at this point, basically, Devontae Parker is everything that we kind of wanted Robbie Anderson to be. Uh, in the season and speaking on Le'Veon Bell we'll pivot to the running backs uh, Le'Veon Bell missed his second practice in a row uh, on Friday it's with an illness so for the most part that usually does not keep guys out of the game however like the last couple of weeks we've seen uh, a lot of illnesses going around the NFL we had the Patriots taking double uh, double planes to separate the sick players from the non-sick players and we've like Tyler Lockett sure. dealing, <laughs> dealing with an, uh, an illness uh, after the leg injury so We've seen a lot of this going around, and it seems like it's been affecting some of the players, and I don't really know what these illnesses are. They never give us specifications. But Bell's been out for two straight games. Um, and It just seems like, I don't know, Bell, the matchup is great, but he's just – he's had so many great matchups. I mean, the Jets have had a great schedule this year, and he's disappointed on so many different levels. So I, I think um, – I don't know if Le'Veon Bell's a guy I'd like to rely on, especially when you have, um, you know, an Alvin Kamara, $200 less than him, who hasn't gotten in the end zone in a long, long time. But, I mean, he's, he's definitely due – Aaron Jones is $500 less than Le'Veon Bell. And I know he's been inconsistent as well, but the matchup couldn't be uh, any better for a guy like um, Aaron Jones there. And you're looking at the top, the, the top players on this week's slate. I mean, Christian McCaffrey, obviously you can't sit it. I love how they, they price him down. Like he didn't have a touchdown or something last week. So they took off to $100. Like it was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. You have Dalvin yeah. Cook, who's banged up. Um, I kind of like Nick Chubb this week. Um, just because the matchup is so good and he hasn't really had one of his big premier like breakout games in a long time. And it seems like this is probably the week that it gets uh, put together. One guy <clears throat> I absolutely love <clears throat> is Melvin Gordon. His volume has been fantastic. He's involved on all three downs. He's getting all the goal line work. And now he gets Jacksonville who has been absolutely shredded by every running back they went against. Woo. I'm dying over here. Hold on. <coughs> They're getting absolutely killed on the ground. And last week, they, they basically made Peyton Barber look like a good running back again. So, like, this seems like a, a week that Melvin Gordon's actually going to, you know, smash against the Jaguars. Where are we at on these top, these top running back guys? And, I mean, if we're going to be paying down, it seems like Patrick Laird, Lard, whatever the fuck his last name is, is a, is a very popular play this week. Yeah, as, as much as I hate quarterback, I feel like there's a lot of really – good running back plays this week, which is, which is nice. And some guys that are going to see volume that are on the cheaper side as well. You mentioned Patrick Laird. Have you been watching this whole uh, ordeal on Twitter with Davis Maddock and that Patrick Laird thing? Or are you not really in those streets at all? Um, so, yeah, I, I've, <clears throat> I've seen it a little bit. I know he, like, goes crazy for Patrick Laird. And, and he tried to, like, tout him a couple weeks ago or whatever. And then he finally got him onto his podcast. I didn't listen to it. Was it a yeah, – it, start, it? it started off started off as like kind of a joke him and Peter Overs that I, I love both those guys I think they're they're some of the few guys in the industry that like actually care about doing stuff that's like kind of entertaining too but like kind of undercover sharp in certain ways too so uh yeah so the Patrick Laird was 100% not a play uh this week I actually think he's he's in play uh so I don't know if I'll he's really not my type of guy anyway like I think there's a chance that um maybe they want to What's the other running back in that backfield? I'm blanking on it right now. Haskins. Um, they, Haskins. Yeah, Haskins. So they, they gave away a draft pick for him last year, I believe. So I think they're going to want to at least give him a look. Um, yeah. That said, I think Laird at 4,100 opens up a lot if you think he's going to touch the ball 16 times and he's going to get a decent amount of run through the air. Um, I don't love it. I, th I think that the, the price does a lot for you on this week when there's really no one else uh, all the way down there that I'm interested in. But to kind of tie a bow on Le'Veon Bell, 
He's 7,200. He's someone that I actually liked quite a bit earlier in the week. Um, obviously, this, this sickness that's going around is at least concerning. But what's a little bit more concerning for me is just how his touch volume has been down uh, significantly over the last few weeks. His reception totals are still pretty solid. He's still had, uh, I believe, five and four receptions over the last two games. But like on the ground, he's just not seeing near the volume he had before 10 10 carries, 12 carries a week before that. So, like, a guy that's already going to be inefficient for a team that I don't expect, like, um, I don't know. I, I guess it's against Miami, so that's kind of the, the that's plus it. side of the matchup. But, yeah, he seems too expensive to me, which is crazy. Like, he probably still has a, a decent ceiling if he does get the volume. I guess think there's a little bit more volatility there than people are willing to admit. Miami, 32nd in the league at defending running backs in the passing game. So, like, I think he's fine. I wish he was, like – the price of Aaron Jones. I wish he was like 6,700. Um, I'm kind of with you on Melvin Gordon. There was a, a week last year, the year before, I can't remember when it was, Melvin Gordon was just like severely underpriced coming off of uh, an injury. He like basically wasn't doing anything for a few weeks, but he was seeing volume. And then he just went absolutely crazy at like 6,500, like almost like the same exact price. So I think that he's going to draw a lot of ownership actually, especially because of the matchup, like you said, Jacksonville 32nd DVOA versus the run. Uh, Melvin Gordon, like we were just talking about Le'Veon Bell and his touch counts, like Melvin Gordon has been going the other way recently. So um, I hate Melvin Gordon as a player. Like I've been on record as saying that for like four years now. Uh, but the volume is, is very nice. You know that he's going to have that red zone uh, involvement as well. And if they're really trying to take the ball out of River's hands, like you would think that they would probably just lean on on Gordon and Eckler. So yeah, I like the Gordon call quite a bit, especially in this matchup. It definitely makes sense. Uh, nice price point for him. Uh, I'm not really with you on Chubb. I, I know a lot of people are, are kind of going to go that route this week. Uh, I he think that, all right. yeah, he's, he's AK. Like it's Cincinnati. They're horrible. Um, I, so I'm with you on that. I, I think I prefer the pass catchers for Cleveland still OBJ. And, you and Landry. need a rushing touchdown out of Chubb in order. Yeah, for maybe two. That's AK is a, a high price. That's the same issue I have with Derrick Henry, man. 8,200. Right. For that's him, for, it, that's, that's a hard, that's yeah. a very hard price tag to hit if you don't get catch, catch passes at all. Like yeah. if it, it's, it's just really hard. And I think that people will fall into that. Um, both of those guys are probably okay in large field stuff. I'm just not going anywhere near them in single entry this week. I still think Leonard Fournette's in play, man. 7,800. Like you're talking about all these guys that are like um, priced up like Chubb, Henry, even uh, Dalvin cook. We'll talk about him in a minute, but uh, Chubb at eight, er, sorry, uh, Fournette at 7,800 still like, I just, I, I can't ignore the volume. I, I know that it's like so frustrating to watch this guy. just like run into the line of scrimmage and like have like, two yards per carry but um his involvement through the passing game is what gets me there man he had nine catches in back-to-back -back games like this guy is 7800 and he's got at least seven catches in three straight games like i, I have a hard time fading that on FanDuel, he's basically a lock he's 7500 on FanDuel. he's priced like basically around like the Le'Veon bell uh tier on FanDuel. So i think he's like severely underpriced over there DraftKings, you can make an argument for some of these other guys but um, I still love Fournette. I think that he's – at some point, he's just going to go crazy again, and, and I want to be there for that one because I've kind of been on his train most of the season. Um, Dalvin Cook's an interesting one for tournaments. Um, they, and I can kind of give at least uh, some sort of personal analysis here. That AC joint sprain that he has in his shoulder was something that I had my last year pro, and they basically just give you – it was during the playoffs, so they basically can just give you a cortisone shot, and then you don't feel anything, like literally nothing. And this is a game that Minnesota has to win. So if they've already said multiple times that he's going to play, I guess assume that they're going to shoot him up with a cortisone shot. He's going to be fine. And if they lean on him and you get him at like sub 10%, sub 5% ownership at 9,500, he's probably too expensive, but it's a massive team total there. Like Detroit is terrible. Uh, and this is a game that they have to have, like I said. So even if Madison gets involved, which is always like the concern with Dalvin Cook, I think he makes like an elite tournament play. If people just aren't going to go there because of this injury, I think he's going to be fine. Interesting. So like with the Dalvin Cook thing, you say you're speaking from experience. So say they give him a cortisone shot, he's playing in the game, he's not feeling these hits. Like if he were to re-aggravate it or re-injure it and make he it worse, it. he won't feel it. Oh, I mean, he could make it worse for sure, but that doesn't really matter for this week. Jesus Christ. All right. So <laughs> shout out to the NFL for, for those things. Um, so I, I think, dude, I, I think Joe Mixon is really going under the radar too. I think Joe Mixon's volume and the way they're using him He's been way better the last few weeks than he has been uh, at the beginning of the season. And a lot of people are going to be off him. Although he did have a good game, he ended up with 23 touches, four catches, uh, and did score a touchdown. His rushing effectiveness was terrible last week, 19 for 44. But that's against the Jets' run defense, who has low-key been like elite this year. So I didn't expect a good game out of Mixon, but uh, the game before that, 4.4 yards per carry. The game before that, 5.7 yards per carry and, uh, and a touchdown. Game before that was the 30 for 114 and, you know, uh, like almost 40 yards through the air against Baltimore. So against Cleveland, I mean, I'm looking at PFF and they are 
the fifth worst graded run defense in the NFL. And this is a guy you're getting at 5,900 that is almost locked into a 20 touch workload. So I like mix or 5,800. I like mixing yeah. a lot. Uh, I think just talking about other injuries around the league. I mean, you mentioned uh, Dalvin cook and he's been saying that he's going to play since the beginning of the week, like right after the game, he was like, I'm playing next week. No doubt about it. So it right, seems right. like he's, he's almost definitely playing. If he doesn't, I mean, it seems like Madison is pretty much. Oh, in absolute auto. lock. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you have to play Madison. I want to, I want to guess your, uh, or gauge your thoughts on the Kansas city backfield. Now for, for a while, like, you know, especially the season long analysis during the summer was like, Oh, you know, you just want pieces of this backfield. You want anyone in the backfield because they're going to score a ton of points. They're going to score a lot of touchdowns. That's been like literally the opposite of what the chiefs backfield has done this year because they've dealt with so many injuries. Uh, they're not running, they're, they're passing the ball at like a 75% rate. So they're not getting a lot of touches unless they're getting it through the air, but it's been a little bit difficult to predict. Now we have Damon Williams who's not going to play again this week. We have Darrell Williams who's not going to play this week. So that pretty much leaves us leaning on uh, LaShawn McCoy and Darwin Thompson. And I don't think they're going to give Darwin Thompson that many touches. So I expect a pretty uh, big game in terms of like workload volume for Shady McCoy. Obviously he's kind of like a shell of himself at this point. But I think in tournament plays, he makes a, an interesting case at like 4,400. 4, it's obviously against New England, um, but it takes like one big play for a running back at that, at that price to return pretty good value. So what are your thoughts on LaShawn McCoy, especially if he gets the goal line work there? Yeah, I don't love it. I, I do think that like if you're playing a large field tournament, like throw him in there, hope that you catch gold or catch fire with that. I think it's okay. I'm willing to definitely take the L on this backfield. Just like I, I like Damian quite a bit coming into the season. He's someone that, uh, just performed really well in my rushing expectation methodology. Uh, I think that I'm ready to just say that Andy Reid running backs just perform really well in my methodology because it just happens to always say, be I think, on Spencer Ware, all those guys. They always smash. They always wrong. smash. Yeah, I don't think anyone was wrong on Damian Williams have, had he stayed healthy. But I also think, like, this was something I tweeted during the summer, and I was like, you know, mm -hmm. if Damian Williams smashes for the first six or eight weeks and then gets hurt, you know, does the people who really like him win that argument or the people who don't like him? I would side with the people sure. that don't like him because one of the key factors going into the year was like, we've never seen him handle a workload. So when you're in the right, NFL right. and you start handling the workload, you get hurt. Those are, that's something that's kind of predictive and that should be in your analysis. So like when I'm looking at Damon Williams, like the right analysis would have been like, yes, we've never seen him handle the workload. So can he handle that workload in the NFL? But at the same time, like if he had stayed healthy, I'm sure he would have continued to catch a ton of balls and probably score a lot of touchdowns. It was just like, when you have a backfield with that many heads in it, the leash for the workhorse or the, or the starter is just so short. So as soon as he went down with the injury, it was like, you know, the, the floodgates kind of opened up. So, I mean, it, it's difficult to predict, but I still think if he can get back onto the field by like next week, I still think he retains that workhorse role. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't think for this week, either of those guys are in play for me. I think there's a couple other guys I want your take on before we move on for running back though. in this mid range, like uh, people are talking about Devonta Freeman at 5,400. Also been a little bit of talk about Kenyon Drake at 5,200. I, I'm warming up a little bit to Drake the more I look into his workload a little bit. And I think he's going to be far lower owned than Devonta Freeman. I think Devonta Freeman shapes up as like someone that people are going to talk themselves into in this matchup against Carolina. Can touch the ball probably 20 times, decent total at home, all that. Um, I kind of like Kenyon Drake just because of how much he's used in the passing game. Um, and I think that there's a chance like Pittsburgh is going to get to Kyler in this spot. Like we know that. So if, if it just leads to more dump offs for Kenyon Drake, I actually have a little bit of interest there at 5,200. He's someone that over the last few weeks, like he's still carrying the ball over 10 times, but he, he his, his stat line almost, or it's not his stat line, his usage looks like almost like a little, little uh, like an Alvin Kamara light almost. Like he's got seven targets in two of his last three games. Like his usage through the air, he hasn't popped off a big play or anything like that. But I don't know. I, I've fallen into the Kenyon Drake, uh, I guess, trap a couple times. And this Arizona backfield is, is pretty scary right now. But I don't know, 5,200, I think he's worth a, a dart in, in a larger field tournament. Yeah, I, I think Kenyon Drake makes sense just based on his usage. But I, I don't know. One of those games is coming where, like, Chase Edmonds gets 10 touches or David oh, gets the 10 or 12 touches. I, I can't imagine they keep riding him. I will yeah, say, yeah. though, after he – like, a lot of people are probably still thinking back on that game he had a month ago with San Fran where he popped off for, like, 160 total yards. Since then, I mean, he's been, he's been pretty miserable with his efficiency. I mean, he's getting sure. a lot of work. Like, he's had six catches in two of the last three games. But like his yards per carry, three, three and a half, four point two, two point four. They are against Tampa Bay, San Fran, uh, and the LA Rams. So it's very, very tough run defenses. Um, so I think that's probably a positive in his favor. The fact that he's been very, very uh, bad in an efficiency 
measure. Um, so I would like Kenyon Drake over Devonta Freeman because Devonta Freeman, I just don't think is good at football anymore. I just think his body yeah. is bruised and battered. And every once in a while he comes out and catches like eight passes. He's done that twice this year. But the rest of the games, you look at it. I mean, last week he caught four for 13 yards, three for 10 yards, two weeks prior to that, two for six yards. I think more likely than not, like, yes, the reception total might be there, which is obviously big for DraftKings because it's full PPR. But he's awful on the ground. The guy doesn't – the guy has 124 carries this year, zero rushing touchdowns, 3.4 yards per carry. He's, he's just not getting it done when they get to, you know, the red zone and when they get to the goal line. And his receiving workload has been – very promising but like it just he's not good enough to make something out of nothing i think he shapes up as like a fantastic fade this week like he literally the last game he had 17 carries for 51 yards i'm just gonna let other people mess around with that yeah exactly it's just like i don't know i i think you're 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 making up a hypothetical upside for devonta freeman that i just don't think exists i mean maybe if he hits and and you get on onto that big game like you feel good about, uh, good about it, but you're playing whack-a-mole trying to guess the week that Devonta Freeman is going to break out. Sure. I think All that's right. pretty much it for me at running back. Okay. Let's pivot over to wide receivers. And this is another week where, you know, the top guys, Michael Thomas, I, I mean, he goes against San Francisco, which has been like probably the top coverage defense in the league. Maybe the, the Patriots have been a little better, but Michael Thomas, it's like he's been so good, but this defense has been so good. I don't know if you pay up 8,300 to get him. I mean, I think a, a way that you could do that, obviously, is if some of the injury workings kind of work in our favor as DFS players this week. Like, you get C-Mac, and then Dalvin Cook sits, or, you know, you play Patrick Lair or something like that, a couple guys that are 4,000, 4,500, and you could pay up at wide receiver. Um, I kind of like Tyreek Hill. I like Tyreek Hill because he just seems like one of those players in the NFL. It doesn't, it doesn't matter who they're playing against. You know what I mean? Like, Tyreek Hill is so dynamic as a playmaker – that no matter, like, okay, you could have a great shadow coverage guy on him, but no one can keep up with Tyreek Hill's speed, and that's the way he eats. Also, the last few times that the Patriots have played the Chiefs, I mean, the best thing that they do, you know, every single week, week in, week out, is take away your top um, weapon. I'm really intrigued by this game because they've taken away Travis Kelsey, like, the last three times that they played. I, I, I'd have to assume that Bill understands that Tyreek Hill is probably their best weapon at this point, right? Like, I, I, they have to start covering Tyreek Hill with the double coverage rather than, than Travis Kelsey. Like, I let Travis Kelsey get those 8-yard, 10-yard, 12-yard routes and, and receptions. But, like, I like Tyreek Hill just because of the player he is and the fact that they just keep taking away Kelsey. But, like, what do you, what do you think about um, how the Patriots defense will kind of attack the Chiefs offense? Yeah, I need to, I think, get over last week's bias with Tyreek kill because I ended up uh, trying to leverage Devontae Adams with Tyreek Hill and legitimately if that exact team on FanDuel would have had uh, Devontae Adams instead of Tyreek probably would have uh, really been live to win the Sunday million which would uh, which would have been great but yeah Tyreek Hill the reason I played him last week is people got off him because of the weather I the still think that they're trying to they're trying to get the ball into his hands did affect yeah it. Did, it, yeah. yeah so those people were right uh, but I mean he ended up still being really popular on FanDuel anyway um, so 8100 for him I, my concern is what New England's tried to do to defend Tyreek Hill effectively in the past is just keep another safety really uh, over the top. So maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, I guess that would be my big concern. I think that one of these guys, I agree with you, Tyreek or Kelsey, could have a huge game. I'm just not sure which one it's going to be. And I don't know if I want to pay 8100 to find out. Um, Michael Thomas, man, that's it. It's a hard one for me because, like, yes, he's in a vacuum. He's still a fine play. Like, you can still project him for the same Michael Thomas floor probably that we normally would. But the roster construction to get there is tough for me. Like, I, I look at this price and I see, like, oh, I could just play Leonard Fournette for 7800 I could just play, like, I don't know. I, I just ha I have a really hard time with it. Michael Thomas, like, full disclosure, like, this guy is someone that I think I've only played one or two weeks all season. And he's had the consistency as a running back anyway. So that's that's something that we got to like kind of at least put into our minds. 8,300 is probably the cheapest we're going to get him the rest of the year because of the matchup. Um, so I guess I wouldn't be uh, – I'm not quite defense doesn't matter, but at least I'm, I'm skewed towards that side typically. So I think that Michael Thomas is certainly in play. I, I prefer going the Devontae Adams route, even probably uh, the DeAndre Hopkins route at, at the top end. Like those guys are the ones that I – probably prefer I still think that these Cleveland wide receivers are underpriced like in the mid 6k's I think that um, they're I mean their usage is still in a spot where I think both those guys are certainly fine against Cincinnati um, it's an interesting one I, I think that Devontae Parker at 6900 is now at a spot where we probably should take a step back at, but it is the Jets so like he's still probably a fantastic hey, between, play again between DJ Moore at 700 uh, 7,000 Devontae Parker at 6900 I feel like yeah. the choice between those two is going to sway a lot of money this weekend 
hundred percent. Yeah. I think I prefer DJ more. And I don't, I don't know if that's a, a bad take. I like Gusecki quite a bit on, um, on Miami. So I guess that's kind of been my bring back in those stacks just to take care of the tight end position. DJ Moore, like if they, if they end up scaling back Christian McCaffrey at all, I think that DJ Moore might be the one that benefits from that the most. So I think at 7K, 7K for him, Devontae Parker is 69. This is where these guys should have been priced for like three weeks and they're finally like, they're finally there. Um, so yeah. it, it, they're not, they're not bargains by any means anymore. And this is the time of year where you don't really get those type of plays. Like I feel like it was like five straight weeks where this Carolina guys were just so underpriced. Like you had to play them. Um, and now it's, it's definitely a different conversation like these guys are priced around the tampa bay guys like just in general like i think that tampa bay and indy game is one we haven't really talked about yet that i think is going to be pretty crucial to figure out um been pretty fortunate the last couple weeks where i've gotten the the evans versus godwin thing mostly right i think this weekend this week might shape up to be more of an evans week but still trying to make kind of piece my way through that i forgot to actually mention this i think the last time i had someone on my stream and they said that every week they make the same exact team but they make one with Mike Evans and they make one with Godwin and it's worked out. Like he's that's like, I, I was like that, that's like low key. One of the sharpest things I've ever heard because everyone's trying to like piece their way through this. Like, sure. One of your teams has probably been dead, but the other one has been just, I mean, probably going nuts like most weeks. So I thought that's an interesting way to approach it. So I don't know. What do you think about that? That, that is actually fantastic. That is, I agree. That's probably one of the sharpest things I've, <laughs> I've ever heard. And probably I, I laughed and then I thought about it and I was like, wait a second. Cause you're probably getting one of those guys at way lower ownership too. So <laughs> If you step back and do that, I'm, I'm sure there are probably like five or six scenarios in the NFL. I can't really think off the top of my head that if you did that with multiple lineups and just stacked, I mean, none of them are probably to the elite level that uh, those two are at. But even doing that with like, I don't know, just very like poor man's comp here, but like a Hopkins Fuller, assuming Fuller yeah. was healthy for a game and just do that with multiple lineups, even Diggs and Thielen. I think um, it works with like Jarvis Landry and OBJ too. Like if you yeah. just like, well, I mean, it's, it's probably negative EV, but if you don't care about like your like return, you're just trying to hit that big score. Like, upside? Yeah, I, I don't care about wasting a lineup just to try I, and get. I like, think what most the people that watch these videos probably um, are more like casual. You know, let me like fuck around, throw ten bucks in, and maybe yeah, hell yeah, hundred thousand bucks. So I think those are the things that you're probably uh, looking at right now. And if we work our way down, Jesus Christ, stop that. Um, if we're looking at like more lower price wide receivers, there's a couple guys that kind of stand out here. Um, I'm looking at James Washington. He's been so good the last few weeks, making big, 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 big plays one after another, getting way more involved than he had been in the beginning of the year. Uh, the problem is probably volume. Um, I mean, one, I mean, you got to worry about two things. You got to worry about volume. And you just got to worry about that pass off offense overall. Like you, you don't know any given week could be like the 115 yard, you know, three interception week for Devlin Hodges. Um, so I'm curious to know your take on Washington because that Arizona defense has been non-existent. And then we have Tyler Boyd, who's kind of been blowing up since Andy Dalton uh, has returned just over the last couple of weeks. And then going back to Zach Pascal, I, I just think that Indy game is interesting from the other side too, because if you're thinking about Winston and, and Evans and Godwin, like someone on the Indy side has to do something because they're down to no weapons left. They're down to, I think Paris Campbell makes a very interesting um tournament play uh, but like Jack Doyle and Zach Pascal seem like they're probably in line to funnel about 45 to 55 percent of the targets in that game yeah I think some of the guys you mentioned are ones that you have to really kind of figure out this week uh, James Washington to me like I'm with you like I think that he has big play upside I also think 6k is kind of a tough price tag for him but I mean over yeah. the last couple of weeks he's definitely hit on those big plays I like Deontay Johnson a bit just if there's going to be like if, if, if Juju's out there's going to be a decent amount of condensed target share there. And he's only 4,300. And this is a week where I don't love a lot of the, the really cheap wide receivers, like I mentioned before. So um, Zach Pascal in that indie game, I like that call a lot. I think that he, like all these guys, has probably the highest ceiling. Um, you need a bring back on the Tampa Bay side or on the indie side of this game. And I think this is the game that uh, I think makes a lot of sense for points, but I think people might actually kind of avoid because it's not really that easy to figure out. Uh, so I'm interested in Pascal for sure. I, I think Doyle's fine. Um, at tight end this week, I, I think that we have a bunch of like elite tight ends that we haven't had in a while. We also have um, some value. It looks like that Greg, I would assume Greg Olson's not going to play too. So there's uh, some cheaper guys that we could play tight end. So Doyle's, I think Doyle's a fantastic play as well. Uh, Hemmer Pascal, I don't know if I would play both because I don't know if there's going to be a situation where um, Brissett really can carry multiple weapons. So I'm not so much interested in Brissett, but I, I like the idea of bringing back one of either Doyle or Pascal for sure. 
Yeah, I, th I think uh, interestingly enough, the strategy we kind of just laid out before too, I think might be might be a good idea. If you want to get a little crazy and run off that Miami New York Jets game? How we said before, run with Fitz, run with one of his weapons, either Gasicki or Parker, and then run it back with two different lineups: one with Crowder, one with Robbie Anderson. I think that's a situation where that might work. I don't know if that will pay dividends in case both of them end up busting, but for the most part, I feel like one or the other has had a big game almost week in and week out. You know. Yeah, no, I, I like that quite a bit. The price difference is a little bit significant. I, I like Crowder quite a bit. We, we haven't probably mentioned him enough. He's 5,300, and we're talking about all these other guys. That, like, Crowder is someone that I think could have a huge game in, in this spot. So, yeah, uh, I think I'm one. So it's not, it's not too yeah, hard. I guess that's true. Yeah, it is. It's a lot closer than I realized. I didn't realize Robbie was kind of priced up. That He was a lot cheaper the last couple of weeks. So I guess he has played a little bit better. So it, it's a tough week at wide receiver. I think this, like we said in the beginning, it's it's so spread out this week. I don't. I don't see like a lot of like just massive chalk. And normally by this point of the week, I have a pretty good idea of what people are going to be on. And especially wide receiver. Like normally we have like a, at least one or two value plays that really stand out. And like, you're just looking at some of the ownership right now. And there's really not anyone below 5k that's standing out as like a really chalky play. Like I think Mike Williams might draw a little bit of ownership. I've lost enough money on Mike Williams this year. Maybe I'm going to let other people wait for that touchdown that might never come. Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, his volume has been great. He obviously just uh, popped off for 117 yards last week against Denver. Uh, I don't know. What do you think about him at 4,500? And then I think that we could probably move on. Uh, this was the first week. Uh, I'm a very anti Mike Williams guy, but this was the first week I intentionally moved him up in my rankings. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting a better feeling about Mike Williams and I would not hate um, playing against him. I mean, he's been very good over the last four weeks now, probably basically five weeks. And those were really tough matchups for outside wide receivers, Chicago, Green Bay, Kansas City, Denver, um, in Oakland so it's like he's, he's starting to prove something and Philip Rivers is looking his way more I think the other thing to be considered here is like how long is Philip Rivers going to be under center for the Chargers now which I guess doesn't really matter on a week-to-week -week basis but um, it, I mean it could happen at any time if, if he throws two picks in the first half I highly doubt he's running out there against Jacksonville after uh, after halftime but that's that's probably uh, a little bit of a reach there I mean staying within that game if we're looking at the tight ends I mean yeah, it just seems like a week that we're going to have to pay down. You have Hunter Henry kind of in the middle in 5,100. He hasn't been too consistent as of late. Kelsey against New England, I don't think he could play. Hooper coming back after a month, you know, stretch of not playing. I think the only way you could probably throw him in confidently is if Julio misses this game. But Julio has practiced uh, for like the last two or three days consecutively. So it seems like he's going to be suiting up. George Kittle's a little banged up against uh, the Saints. So that's tough. Um, I don't know. Where's your head at when it comes to tight end? Are you definitely just paying down, even though it's not really even paying down too much for Jack Doyle? But Jack Doyle seems like he's got great ceiling for a guy even in the middle range of values. You have McDonald, who has just been so bad, but he's going against Arizona, who makes every tight end look so good. I think a lot of those guys at, at 4K or below are, are probably in play here. Yeah, if Greg Golson doesn't play in cash games on DraftKings, I'm just going to play Ian Thomas at, at uh, 2,500. He's just so cheap that I think that uh, he's someone that's, I mean, I, I'm an Ian Thomas fan. Just I play a lot of preseason DFS as well. And I, I think that he's someone that last year when Greg Olson was out um, had some usable games for us. So I think you just take the savings there with Ian Thomas and not mess around in, in kind of that mid range, uh, at least in cash games. In tournaments, it's harder. Like, yeah, they priced up Vance McDonald to 4,300 on DraftKings. He's 5,800 on FanDuel, which is insane. So, like, just wow. to give you an idea of, like, who he's priced around on FanDuel. So, he's 5,800. We have Darren Waller at 6,200. Jack wow. Doyle is only 500 more for 6,300. Like, he's more expensive than Gesicki. Like, I don't know. I, I can't justify Vance McDonald on FanDuel at all. I think we'll get him at really low ownership because no one's going to want to pay that price. Uh, but yeah, and I'm a Vance McDonald fan. Like I, I think, I think I mentioned this earlier in the year, but this picture behind me was Stefan Diggs. Like that was, uh, by one of my biggest hits ever in DFS, that Minnesota miracle catch. But I had Vance McDonald in a full Pittsburgh stack against the Jacksonville defense on that team. So like, I'm a Vance fan. He popped off for like a 10 catches and 130 yards or something absurd in that playoff I remember game. That. Yeah. It was yeah. like, uh, it was a playoff game, right? Yeah. And he had like 16 targets or something like that. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah I remember that. Yeah, that playoff, like, playoff DFS, by the way, is like low key, like the best thing ever because you, you have so much, dis like you have so much time to do late swaps and make decisions. You can almost like build your team as the slate goes on. So like you start off and whatever the best case scenario is that the worst game is terrible and it just goes over own and then you can just kind of move through and if your team's doing really well you can stick with some of like the the really good chalk plays if your team's doing terribly you just pivot to lower own plays in the next game and it's basically where it worked out for me like two years in a row is just like if your team's behind you just pivot to the lowest owned team and if it goes nuts out of nowhere you pass everyone basically oh, 
I feel like all those like quirky ass lineups, like postseason, preseason, are always the most profitable for people like you. Especially oh yeah, because like you're so deep into the research, and people at that point in the season, uh, it's since once it starts condensing the lineups and stuff, once it starts condensing the number of teams, you have to be able to like go deep and understand, you know, the deeper players on the depth charts and who can fit into that um, the money makeup. But right now, when you have you know fucking sixteen different games going on, it's hard. You, yeah, I mean, you have you have a lot of options to choose from, and a lot of people will play the chalky guys all the time. But so uh, the ownership gets condensed so much more in this, and when there's less games too, right? right? So you can leverage a lot easier. So like anyone that's still watching this on your channel, like hopefully they're still dabbling a little bit into DFS. But when season long's over, like postseason DFS is like my favorite time of the year because if you're willing to actually do late swaps and do uncomfortable things, it's like it's it's a really profitable time of the year for people that like want to actually take it seriously. Let me ask you about preseason DFS. Now, is mm -hmm. that would you consider that like a good money making time for you guys? Because this year I feel oh, like best was, time of the year. Really? Okay. Because this year I feel like it was really difficult to project. Now I wasn't in it to like the third and fourth stringers. Like I didn't even really know it that deep at this point. But like this year in particular, it seemed like teams were doing a lot of weird shit with their lineups. Like most of them didn't even play their quarterbacks throughout the preseason. So it was very hard to get a like how do you get a feel for um like which running backs are gonna get Mm -hmm. you know touches in the first half and the second half and things like that because i felt like this year in particular was uh, it has been a lot different than uh the, the previous years yeah the edge in preseason dfs is huge it actually I'll, I'll say it was better a couple of people used to get straight forfeit they would just like literally play lineups with like guys that were starters that were going to play like three snaps or not play at all this year like yeah there's more content out there for it there's better information the thing about preseason it's essentially nba like you're watching beat writers you're trying to get an idea of who's going to play snaps who's gonna like a quarterback you want the guy that's if the guy plays two quarters he's like basically a lock like because these guys aren't going to play very often so um and then basically at wide receiver and tight end you just want guys that are running routes that again are going to play in the game um but you're also looking at depth charts it's really big for depth charts too because you want to focus on teams that like maybe they're just really thin at wide receiver they don't have a ton of options or um like in it like in years past just only playing teams that have one kicker on the roster when kicker was the thing on FanDuel, but it's like, it's more or less like looking at new, it's a totally different game, but it's a huge, there's still a huge edge because you can basically run out what you think is right. Um, and in GPPs keep like a really small core based on like running backs are pretty easy to project. Like tight end is, is crazy in preseason. Cause like, if you get like a catch for like two catches for 30 yards at tight end, like you're doing cartwheels because most of the time you just get like any, like a basically a zero at tight end. So it's fun. It's, it's something that's a, it's a nice uh, bankroll builder before NFL season starts typically. But if you want to do it seriously, like it's a lot of work, it's more work than the regular season for sure. Cause you actually have to keep up with everything that's happening. With him. I was going to say, you really got to like dig into the trenches to find out, like you said, play, like, don't play it really. casually. If you're playing it casually, you'll lose all your money. Yeah, well, that's why you're here. That's why, that's why yeah. we have you over here, Joe. I yeah. think I'm going to get into like a lot of player props and, and things like that around that time of the year, which could yeah. be, could be fine, uh, kind of fun. So, covered tight end, covered all the other positions. Let's wrap this up with defense now. Let me let me look. I haven't even looked at the defense. So, if you want to actually just take this over, yeah, yeah. Rebuttal so, I think if we're paying all the way up, it, it's pretty clearly going to be Green Bay or Minnesota. Um, I, I think that both of those teams are, are kind of where I'm at. Right now, um, targeting Haskins has been a pretty profitable situation. Like 14.2% sack rate is completely absurd. Um, they're uh, double-digit favorites in terms of Green Bay. Green Bay is a team that does pressure a good amount as well. Uh, so Sports Info Solutions sends me a lot of pressure rate data every week. Uh, so I'm keeping an eye on teams that pressure over the, the entire season, but also teams that are pressuring more lately. So uh, in terms of that, um, some of the teams that are pressuring a lot more lately than before, Tennessee, believe it or not, is pressuring a lot more. Uh, right. Detroit. Right. Go ahead. What about Tampa Bay? Oh, Tampa Bay. Let's take a look. Uh, they've been in a, they've been someone that I've been basically kind of, neutral. Neutral. Okay. They've been a, a team that I've been kind of like hot on when it comes to defense week over week, and they've been they've been very good uh, the last couple of weeks at Atlanta at Jacksonville. They get this home game against Indy, and like Indy's not necessarily an offense I want to target because they're pretty slow paced and they don't pass too much. But I feel like the fact that they have no weapons, this Buccaneers defense is probably. I mean, they're, they're playing pretty high. I feel like they're going to eat them alive. They have nothing to play for either. I could see it. I, I, I think I don't even hate the indie side. Uh, that's, a, that's one of the teams that's kind of popping a little bit for a team that's pressuring more lately as well. So I think both defenses probably in play. So, yeah, like we're trying to piece together that game. Maybe the, maybe the real answer is just to play the defenses because, you know, Jameis is going to be passing volume on that side of it at least. And, uh, yeah, so I don't hate that. I, I think there's a couple that 
I, I'm kind of a sucker for the Cardinals defense because there's always so many plays and they pressure a ton. 43.6% pressure rate is, is very high. Uh, the Pittsburgh offensive line, you could probably argue that they're one of the worst offensive lines in the league. So I have some interest there for sure. Um, I, I think if you wanted to move up to the Cleveland defense, they're pretty expensive. But against Cincinnati, again, like targeting that situation, Andy Dalton, I, I'm in on that. Cleveland's another team that's pressuring a lot more um, most recently. Uh, kind of on the other side of things, like teams that were pressuring a lot um, that aren't pressuring near as much now, uh, Minnesota, actually. So, like, I, I think that Minnesota is definitely still in play um, just because of who they're facing on the other side. But uh, it's an interesting, I guess, uh, development that they haven't pressured as much, but they have been a lot better at home. So I will say that. Um, Indy, or sorry, New Orleans hasn't pressured near as much lately. So I've heard some New Orleans top because of 3,100. Um, Jimmy Garoppolo is someone that um, will hold on to the ball a little bit long at times. But I, I think that, that they're probably a little bit overpriced i think green bay is the one that really stands out to me overall if you're paying up paying down probably arizona or cincinnati i think cincinnati is an interesting one at the the super cheap end um at the at, on dk at least like they're only 2100 against baker like again cleveland's offensive line is not great um top three pressure rate for for cincinnati over the last four weeks so uh, i don't hate that either yeah I, I tried to grab the packers in all of my season long leagues like last week before this week's game. Sure kicked off yeah because you just look at it's the easiest way to just stream defenses throughout the uh, fantasy playoffs just look whatever's happening next week grab a guy for this week and now Green Bay is like probably going to score me like 17 points sitting on there on the on the defensive side of things so yeah I, I, I get what you're saying with the Cardinals I feel like in, in theory it makes sense but I don't I, I really don't feel like they've actually done anything like week over they week. haven't they have one game of like double digit points from a fantasy perspective so I, in theory, like looking for, you know, a lot of dropbacks and pressure rate and things like that. I just, I mean, it's just one of those things that's so hard. A, a defensive score, you know, makes you. Oh, I mean, you're hundred percent right, man. They, I mean, they had 14 points against the Giants like six weeks ago, but outside of that, like they haven't done a whole lot. So I'm with you. It, it's one of those ones that like, you can look at all this stuff there, no matter what you're using to make this type of, like, there's always going to be holes. Maybe they're kind of a hole for me. Yeah. I mean, listen, if you're going to pay down, there's going to be a tons of problems with any defense that's priced that low. Sure. So that is our DFS show for week 14. If y'all enjoyed, make sure you smash that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel. If you are new, make sure you're subscribed to Joe's channel and are following him on Twitter and LinkedIn and all the other social platforms, which will be linked down below. Drop a comment with some of your favorite DFS plays of this week and some of your favorite player prop bets but that is all for now we'll see y'all uh next saturday peace